for those of you that haven't been uh, part of the last three classes, we're doing a four-part series on what are called the divine abodes. And those, that means the divine dwelling places. It's where our awakened heart-mind lives uh, when we're really in, in that freedom. And the first expression or the first abode is love. The second is compassion. The third is joy. Tonight we're on to the fourth, uh, which is equanimity. And I notice that often when I share what these are, people are very juiced and wanting to hear the first three and they get to equanimity and it's like, eh, you know. It doesn't have quite, it's not quite the sex appeal, you know, of love and joy. And, um, but actually, as you'll explore, it is. I will share though that my first introduction to Buddhism was in 11th grade in a comparative religion class. And I remember when I heard about the middle way, when I heard about equanimity, when I heard about not getting caught in desire, I immediately wrote off Buddhism as not for me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and of course over the years I've discovered that um, the middle way and equanimity are actually the grounds for the deepest happiness possible, which of course is what we'll be exploring tonight. So, what is equanimity? Equanimity is the freedom or balance that we experience when we're not grasping after anything and when we're not pushing away anything. It's that, that open-handedness that's really receiving the moment as it is. No tinkering, just being. And there's this kind of spaciousness that opens up and, it's, and it allows for all the uh, expressions of our natural being to arise. I thought maybe I would uh, share a poem with you that I've always liked that I feel kind of communicate some of this and it's called Duck Meditation. <laughs> now we are ready to look at something pretty special. It is a duck riding the ocean a hundred feet beyond the surf as it cuddles in the swells. There's a big heaving in the Atlantic and he is part of it. He can rest while the Atlantic heaves because he rests in the Atlantic. He probably doesn't know how large the ocean is and neither do you. But he realizes it somewhere and what does he do, I ask you? He sits down in it duck meditation. He reposes in the immediate as if it were infinity, which it is. That is religion and the duck has it. How about you? <laughs> duck meditation. <laughs> Do you like that? <laughs> yeah. So, duck dharma. I mean, there are there's some really deep teachings in this one. <laughs> and at the core, it's that life is really uh, these changing currents, just like the ocean, you know, continuous moving waves of experience. And either we can fight it, try to manipulate it, try to manage it, or we can sit down in it, we can experience the life. You know, rather than controlling it, we can live it. So, the practices of equanimity are learning to sit down in the immediate as if it's the infinite, which it is, and sense that as the whole, sense the Atlantic, sense our wholeness, our belonging. Now, as with love and as with compassion and as with joy, this open state that's not reactive, not grasping, not resisting, actually is our natural state. It's who we are when we're at rest. It's, it's a capacity that every one of us has. We each have this capacity for this kind of freedom, this non-reactive freedom. It's part of our nervous system. It's what happens when instead of fight or flight, we're in that parasympathetic nervous system that's actually replenishing. That rest is replenishing. 
and there's brainwave states that correlate rather than the fight, flight, narrow focus, you know, beta activity, it's more moving towards alpha. And our biochemistry is uh, part of this too, where there's really a sense of belonging, of connection, there's a kind of biochemical cocktail that goes with it. So it's part of our capacity, and yet as we know, our conditioning is often to be revved up and not resting. So the conditioning, when it kind of settles down, and that resting in what is, gives the space for our natural uh, expressions of heart to really be there, we can connect with our world. But I want to, before I continue, address what I think are the misunderstandings about equanimity. Because, it's not just me in high school, I mean I have a number of very good friends that are incredibly bright and really love a lot about Buddhism and about meditation, but they get tense with talks on equanimity. And uh, one of them, it's almost like every time she asks the same question, which is, yeah, but if we're in that equanimous, non-reactive place, how are we ever going to solve the problems of this world? I mean, what are we going to do about this environment that is, um, that greed and delusion is destroying our own earth? And what are we going to do about these places where the cycles of war are just not ending? Are we going to sit back? Are we going to sit back and let people that are our brothers and sisters be oppressed because of their sexual preference or their color? In other words, is, this is like, what about activism? And I think it's a really important question because equanimity is not about being resigned. It's not about being dead. It's not about um, di not disengaging. I remember one little story of a coach is saying to one of his players that's been having a rough time, what is it with you? Is it indifference or apathy? Response, I don't know and I don't care. <laughs> it's not that, okay? It's not indifference. I'm thinking right now, um, somebody sent me a beautiful picture of Aung San Suu Kyi with the Dalai Lama. She had, she had just arrived in London and met with him for the first time. And she had, been, she had received the Nobel Peace Prize that she was awarded over 20 years ago. Now she is a beautiful model of someone who has a profound wisdom of equanimity. She's not reacting to situations. She has that kind of presence that's responding from her intelligence, from her care, not from hatred, not from fear. There are other such models. I think of Nelson Mandela who, you know, he's, he's known for 27 years being um, imprisoned and that he actually, rather than getting into that reactivity of hating his jailers, creating an enemy, at one point in his life he asked himself, you know, he was in a depression, he said, he realized he, he didn't have anyone to love because he had been in so long in prison. And he said, who can I love? And he realized he could love his jailers. And he started, the very person that was humiliating him and, uh, and torturing him in different ways, he started, he opened his heart to. They had to replace that jailer because he couldn't do his job. Then another came in, he did the same thing. Now this is the power of equanimity in the world, this presence that lets us respond with intelligence and love rather than continuing the cycles of fear and hatred. So we begin to look and sense, well, how do we come home to that? Because we have a, we're in a predicament, like all living creatures, which is our wiring is not to be equanimous in many situations. I mean, we are wired to react to unpleasantness by pushing it away. We're wired to react to pleasantness by wanting to hold on to it, wanting it to continue. And if we watch ourselves through the day, 
it's amazing how much we are in a continuous trance of trying to control our experience. It's a huge loss of the day. I mean, you can consider today for a moment. And I like to do this. I like to pause and say, okay, how about today? And you might sense, well, what was it like? And how many moments was there that kind of presence that's not trying to manage anything, just receptive, open. As the Buddha said, like a vast sky where there's room for the experiences to come and go. So we begin to sense that, well, we don't have that many moments where we actually come out of that trance. It's like the reptilian and mammalian parts of our brain that are urgently trying to manage everything and protect ourselves and get safe and make sure that we um, get what we need on some levels of our being are much quicker than the cerebral cortex. Like way quicker. So we don't even notice how much we are in constant reactivity. And the more wounds from our early life, the more deprivation, the more, the less uh, healthy, positive attachment, love attachments, the more we're in that trance and the less access we have to equanimity. So that's kind of a given. This is our predicament. So then the inquiry really is how in the midst of that trance do we wake up, do we sense that we're getting pulled around, and do we come back home? Okay, so that's, that's what we're just going to begin to look at because it's only when we're at home do we have access to that very unconditional loving that we long for. It's only when we come home do we really find that inner sanctuary of peace. So when I consider the pathway home, I, there are two main kind of gateways I'd like to talk about. And one of them is the start exactly where you are this moment approach. That is, okay, I got tossed around for the last, you know, few hours with this, but this is as good a moment to start arriving again as any moment in the, in the world. Doesn't matter when we catch ourselves, that's our moment. Wherever we are, that's the entry. Okay, so that's one of the pathways. And then the second pathway, our gateway, is to remind ourselves of the Atlantic, of the ocean that we belong to. And that's also very powerful. Okay, so pathway number one, the start where you are. Um, our practice here gives some of the basic components, which are, in the moment that we're caught, just start naming what's going on. Afraid, nervous, anxious, wanting things different. Name it. Just start naming. And then the next step is, after we name it, is open to how that experience feels right here in the body. Open to the felt sense. So that's the entry back into equanimity. Seems really simple. Just name what's going on and then open to how it feels. But what happens when we try to do that? What happens when we notice, oh, I've been caught, anxious, worrying about this. Then we say, okay, feel it. And then what happens? We just get pulled off again, right? <laughs> I mean, more thoughts, more activity. We don't stay there. It's very hard to stay. It's hard to stay because we are rigged to want to control the experience, not feel what's there. So this is what I call trance, that one wave, let's say we have a wave of um, grasping, of wanting something, of having a craving for food, one wave will then lead to, okay, feel that craving and then, oh, I'm a bad person for really wanting to eat so much. And then we go into a whole thing of how I set up this diet, but I can't quite keep it. And well, maybe did then we start bargaining and we're off and running in trance again. Very hard to just stay with wanting. Often, and this is what we're talking about now is, is in Pali, the language of the Buddhist scriptures, 
uh, the word is papancha. And it's one of my favorite words just because it feels good to say. <laughs> papancha. Um, papancha is that proliferation that we realize we're not equanimous. We realize we're off in a reactive chain, right? And then we say, okay, come home. And we try to come home, but then some other wave carries us away. Usually the papancha is fueled by self-judgment. So if you want to find your way home to equanimity, you have to be very alert to that second arrow of self-judgment. You might find yourself anxious or find that there's craving or find that you're in some way angry or irritated. And instead of just feeling it, the mind will go on to say, I shouldn't be feeling it, something's wrong with me. And then that creates a whole other level of reactivity. We're in trance. So our practice is to begin to recognize these thoughts that carry us away over and over. And I've shared with you that often when I'm to speak going to know I'm going to be speaking on one of these subjects, a part of me knows that something's going to come up that's going to force me to walk my talk. I mean, it always, always happens. It's why I put off dying and death for so long as a Tarama theme. <laughs> but, um, so I had plenty of, you know, experiences this week where I found myself tugged around. And one of the most powerful practices I use, and this is, I think, of a bit of an advanced practice, but I'll share it with you anyway, is to just notice the quality of pleasantness or unpleasantness that's right at the root of being pulled away. So you start getting more and more of that filter that notices, okay, this is unpleasant and you cut right to the root because then, then it's clearer, you're not so caught in all the wrappings of trance. It's unpleasant. Or, oh, this is pleasant. That's, there's wanting, but there's some pleasant there. And just, pleasant, just name it. Today it didn't work though because what happened uh, was I spent about mm, 45 minutes to an hour I was writing a document that was kind of a plan for a workshop I'll be doing at Omega next year on True Refuge. So I was writing out all the copy and I'd come up with my titles and a copy and what this was about and worded it just as carefully as I could. And then, you know, I got that thing where it just disappeared and it said, word is, you know, has, some, has encountered a problem. Do you want to send a message or not? So, so but you know, I, I save every two minutes. So I went, all right. So and then it reappears and the, the form reappeared, but, the, but it was empty. My, and so I called up my live-in tech guy, Jonathan, who's my husband, and he takes care of everything, and he's a magician. And I still wasn't so worried, because I figured he's going to figure it out. And he didn't. You know, it was, it was gone, 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 gone. So then this... You probably know the feeling. It's a very unpleasant, kind of sour, really yucky feeling <laughs> sort of setting in. And, you know, I was trying to sense, well, why is, why does this, what makes this feel so bad? And it's like you've lost a part, chunk of life, you know? Wasted time is like a chunk of life, plus you have to do it again and it's more life. And so I said, okay, here it is. This is equanimity practice. And I started breathing into that kind of sour, yucky feeling and, um, my mind just started spinning on how much else I had to do and how this was such a drag. I said, wait, wait, come back. Unpleasant. Not a prayer. It was just this, it just kept generating these ideas of how I was going to do things, what kind of sequence I was going to do, how was I going to recreate what I did, did I have time right now, should I go back, you know. so. I got lost and finally, you know, I left my room and it's very, very helpful to leave. We get, we get into state-dependent experience, which means everything our, that we're seeing is an association back to what's going on. So I just walked out of the room, which was a, a brilliant strategy, and just started breathing into that place. And when I did, it was really unpleasant, but it was amazing because after 30 seconds of that unpleasant, just the presence with turned into presence. And then the sense of what was happening, this 
victim of lost information, it was like, yes, information was lost, but it wasn't happening to me. It wasn't a sense of my identity being so oppressed. It was like the me was just this awareness that was noticing what was going on. This shift in identity is at the heart of equanimity. The reason the duck can move with the swells of the Atlantic is because it's not taking it personally. <laughs> really. <laughs> now, I'm not trying to turn a duck into a spiritual hero and so on, but just, but you get the idea. When we take things really personally, if we sense there's this separate self here that is only going to be happy if it gets what it wants and is going to be miserable if something happens, then yes, we're going to be in a trance of reactivity a lot. We're going to be fighting the waves. In the moments that we notice what's happening and we agree to put aside all the wrapping of thoughts and just say, okay, just this felt sense, there is a presence with the immediate sensations that itself opens us up to space and to the wisdom that it's not happening to this self. One friend here, we were talking about uh, Ram Dass and how this weekend, he, when he was at Buddha Fest, he was describing having a stroke and how his realization and freedom has come from realizing that a stroke didn't happen to him. It's not like he's this self that got slammed by a stroke. I mean, he may have gone into, the he did go into some reactivity initially, but he found his way to that true refuge of equanimity, of realizing it's just happening. This is just happening. This is an experience of the body-mind. But the what I am is the Atlantic. It's larger. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we practice by noticing when we get tugged around. And for all of us, it's like every single person we're with is going to evoke different things in us and put us into a little bit of a different mind state. And if there's a lot of pleasantness or unpleasantness, we're going to go into a trance. Now, I find the same thing happens to me with, with emails. I, it's amazing to me. I can have a lot of emails and every email I open will put me into a little bit of a different state. And if I'm not aware of how it's going, it's like I'm diving into one portal of virtual reality and then another and my body and mind are yanked with it and my sense of who I am gets kind of shifted around. Some of you might remember one of my favorite uh, stories that's on these lines where a, a couple from uh, the Midwest decide they want to go to Florida for their uh, honeymoon. And uh, they're really, they really want to thaw out. It's been really cold up in Michigan. And so they make their plans because of their busy schedules. He has to go a day before her. And so he arrives, uh, on, he leaves on Thursday. She's going to follow him on Friday. He checks into the hotel, discovers there's a computer in his room, so he decides to send her an email. But he accidentally le leaves out one letter in the address. So um, he sends the email now. Meanwhile, in a whole other part of the world, somewhere in Houston, I guess it is, a woman has just returned home from her husband's funeral. And he's been a minister for many years, and he's been called home to glory, you know, as they say, following a sudden heart attack. So she's at home, and friends and family have kind of uh, been, she's been with friends and family, she decides to get her email. And the first message that she receives, she reads and, and faints. Here's what she read. Her son, the son notices this. It says, to my loving wife. Subject, I've arrived. <laughs> Date, May 20th, 2013. I know you're surprised to hear from me. <laughs> they have computers here now and you're allowed to send emails to your loved ones. <laughs> I've just arrived and been checked in. I see that everything has been prepared for your arrival tomorrow. <laughs> Looking forward to seeing you then. I hope your journey is as uneventful as mine was. P.S. It sure is hot down here. <laughs> so 
so one of the reasons I share this is because even though this is an extreme and, and silly, we believe our thoughts. You know, we believe the thoughts that are going on in our minds and our whole bodies uh, express our thoughts in our biochemistry. So when we're thinking about scary things in the future that might happen, you know, our whole body goes into fight flight just because our thought, we're believing our thoughts. So one of the teachings I think is most powerful when we want to come back into presence, when we want to find that, that sanctuary of equanimity, is to remember that what we're thinking and feeling is real but not true. This is a phrase Sokni Rinpoche shared when he taught here and I think it's really, really helpful that what's going on is real, meaning it exists. We're really actually having an experience. For me, I was really feeling that, that sour feeling and I was really having thoughts that this was interfering with my life. It's real, but it's not true in the sense that what I was believing is not truth itself. You know, it's not like my life is um, going down the tubes because of some lost information. So just to say, okay, it's real but not true, and then honor the real feeling in our body begins to give us some freedom. So the training is, it's like the duck in the waves, that just to stay. You know, rather than going off into the judgment or into the thoughts, just stay. Don't fight, just stay with what's here. So I'll share a, uh, a, an equanimity story of someone who learned this lesson and um, she had been assigned uh, by, she had been having difficulty with her walking meditation. We teach it a lot at retreats, how to just stay awake and in our bodies when we're walking. Beautiful meditation. Just take about 15 paces and you just have a beginning point and end point and you just walk from point A to point B turn around and then walk back to point A. And you quickly realize you're not trying to get anywhere. Rather, you're just finding a certain kind of presence with what is. So she didn't like it. She was having a real difficulty with it and she was assigned by one teacher to just stop sitting and do a whole day of walking meditation. <laughs> so of course she moaned and then they negotiated and they agreed on a half. So this is what happened. She wrote a letter, a note, and saying here's what happened. Long walking meditation, all morning, assignment completed, thank you. Now I can meditate while moving. I thought I might discover why I've been so resistant to it, but no, circumstances taught me something else instead. I chose to walk in the annex walking room because it's small, beautiful, and usually quiet. Today, however, it was noisy as hell. There was some guy in there walking as the little engine that could wearing noisy boots. <laughs> well, I thought, surely he'll be gone when the walking period ends. No such luck. This madman pounded his way through an hour and a half, except when he paused to drink or remove a noisy layer of clothing. I tried metta. Surely he must have a lot of pain to be so driven. Then I realized that I wanted to kill the SOB. <laughs> I stood there noting hate, hate. Later I stood in the middle of the room and wept. Tears, tears. Then I got to the point that I realized that whatever problem he had was his, not mine. After that I got quiet and he was just sound. And so I walked and breathed and he paced and pounded. And pretty, sure it was, pretty soon it was all the same to me, his noise, my breath, the movement of my body. After an hour and a half he left and it was incredibly quiet, which was different, but not as much better as I had expected. Mostly just different. Thank you. <laughs> 